Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Anthony Bolden, and uh, I am the Director of Programs for Chicago Debates. And uh, we're so excited to kick off our very first uh, criminal justice reform lecture series. Uh, we've been planning this for a while uh, now and been you know, excited to roll it out specifically for our students. Uh, we really want them to have uh, the opportunity to dive deep on a great and relevant topic um, as we uh, dive this year on criminal criminal justice reform. So before we get too far, I want to uh, just kind of introduce those who will lead us in this discussion today. First up, we'll have uh, as our very special guest, Mr. Uh, Sharon Mitchell. Uh, Sharon is a former debater at uh, Morgan Park High School and the current director uh, for the Illinois Justice Project. And the person leading us in this conversation is our very own Miss uh, Victoria Yanter. She's one of our program officers for school support. Uh, just a few things before I invite them into the room. I wanna uh, invite you to definitely share your questions. We'll try to get to a few, uh, but share this on your social media, social media whether it's on your Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, on YouTube, however you're using it, share it with your friends. Um, and then we wanna let you know also that this video will be available later on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. So without further ado, I wanna bring in and welcome uh, Victoria and Sharon. Right. Hey y'all. All right, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Sharon and anyone who's um, watching this. <laughs> watching the comments here. And um, so we'll first start off, let you kind of introduce yourself with um, your involvement in Chicago debates. I know you have a lot of connections to us um, and then what you do now. Yeah, uh, my name is Sharon Mitchell Jr. Uh, I am a former debater. I, I debated for Morgan Park High School back in the Stone Ages, 1997 to 2001, when there were only five Chicago uh, schools in, in the Chicago debates. Now they're like a million. Um, and now I work at an organization called uh, Illinois Justice Project, where I'm a director there, uh, and we work on criminal justice reform. Um, we do it uh, day in and day out. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I guess our first question, um, how do you use your debate skills, since you're a former debater in our league, to advocate for criminal justice reform? So I feel like I went pro in debate. I feel like, you know, when you're on a football team, you go pro, you go to the NFL. Uh, I feel like I went pro in debate. So I work as a lobbyist, so sometimes I uh, work with legislators to try to get them to pass uh, criminal justice reform bills. I work with the media, uh, talking with them about criminal justice reform, other advocates about strategizing how we get uh, bills and strategies passed. So uh, stuff like you know reading evidence, um, uh, stuff like uh, coming up with arguments on the fly, uh, trying to be as persuasive as possible. Um, you know everything that you do in debate. Uh, I, I do now in my job. Um, it's incredible. It was, a, it was the best learning experience to do what, what I do now. So, yeah. Amazing. Hopefully some of our kids can use those skills as well <laughs> that are here now. Um, so what exactly is cash bail before? Yeah, so basically when a person is arrested, they typically go before a judge and a judge will make a decision about what will happen to that person uh, during the pendency uh, until the time they go to trial. So a judge has basically three options. The first option is to release the person. That doesn't mean that the case is over. The person is still required to come to court every day till every time until the case is resolved. Um, so that's in Illinois or Cook County, it's called getting an I bond or a Congress's bond. Um, a judge could also say, hey, you're too big of a risk or uh, either because we don't think you're gonna come back to court or we think that you're going to harm people if you're let out, and that is like a no bond. So those are one and two options, a uh, uh, cognizance bond, one, a no bond, two. And a third is kind of a mix of the two. And where a judge, is, uh, what a judge says is, hey, you're eligible to be released, but we're only going to release you if you pay a certain amount of money to the government, and that's a cash bond. So when people are talking about criminal justice reform through ending cash bond or reducing cash bond, it's saying, hey, we shouldn't use money as a factor for determining whether somebody's going to be in or out of jail. But a judge should just make the decision either yes or no, and money shouldn't play a part in it. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so that'll be what 
All right, debaters will be debating this year with the affirmative. Um, so what are some of the reasons to um, reform or eliminate the system? Yeah, so one of the reasons why you'd want to end cash bond is because the vast majority of people who touch the criminal justice system are poor. So if they are poor, that means many people will be in jail, not because a judge is saying that they are too dangerous or too risky to be out, just because they can't afford it. And we know that there is real harm in what we call pretrial incarceration. That's, that's is being in jail or staying in jail before you've been determined uh, to be guilty or not. So personally, people can lose their homes. They can, uh, because they can't pay rent, they lose their jobs, any educational opportunities that they have um, can be gone if they're sitting in jail uh, because in, on, on something they haven't even been proven guilty of. Additionally, we know that there are lots of impacts um, to the case specifically, the criminal case specifically. People who are in jail uh, before trial are more likely to plead guilty. They're more likely to serve longer prison sentences. And we know that there's a real problem in the criminal justice system with mass incarceration and wrongful convictions. And many people say that pretrial incarceration, basically forced by the use of cash bond, is a real driver of those problems. Awesome, awesome. So what does this cash bail reform look like in the state of Illinois right now? I know you've worked a lot with um, it at state level. Like, what does that look like? What are the sort of like bills in play um, yeah. in that movement? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, basically there are 102 counties uh, in the state of Illinois. Uh, so each county has their own policies, but the state can pass a law essentially ending cash bond and each of the counties would have to follow that. So there's been a real vibrant movement to get the state legislator to pass a law that ends the use of cash bond in the state. We've seen it most recently done in Jersey. I think they, don't quote me, I think they did it in like 2017 or 2016. Um, uh, the federal system uh, uh, doesn't use money much and the juvenile system doesn't use money much either. Uh, so that is the move to pass a law to end cash bond and on the state level. Perfect, perfect. So that kind of brings us to the next question, which is, um, so really kind of what cash bail for, um, reforms like have happened? Um, I know you mentioned, I think, um, New Jersey and so like other states, like, so what is this looking like? Is it more federal, state, county? Like, yeah. where is it happening? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, criminal, the thing about the criminal justice system, I know that most people talk about it as a singular piece, but really, there are really thousands of criminal justice systems. There's a card, I think, in the affirmative from John Thaft. He talked about that a lot, how there are lots and lots of criminal justice systems. So um, there have been states that have limited their use of cash bond. There have been counties that have limited use of cash bond. Uh, and there have been states that have completely ended it. So like I talked about before, New Jersey basically completely ended it. There's like some small, 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 like little things you can do to get it, but like, a hundred in the states in hundreds of thousands of cases. Uh, there have been states like Colorado um, that have limited cash bond. Um, there are counties that have limited cash bond. We are in Cook County, which is the largest county in Illinois. Um, we have a Supreme Court, sorry, a, a rule that limits it, uh, but we haven't ended it fully. So there are still thousands of people in jail uh, that would be able to get out um, if they had the ability to pay. Perfect. Um, and then, so the next question is, do you think it should be like more states by state? Like how would the federal government get involved? You mentioned that there's a lot of different like criminal justice systems. It's not yeah. just a system. So kind of how do all those levels intermingle? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a federal uh, kind of criminal justice system. So you can be charged federally. There are a set of crimes that are federal offenses and then there are federal courts. So federal prosecutors, and federal defense attorneys that deal with those cases. There's also a much larger state system. So about, you know, the vast majority of people who are in court are on state charges. Um, so the federal government can choose to regulate their own practices. But like a lot of things, the federal government has a whole lot of money. So if the federal government wanted to end cash bond, what they'd likely do is say, hey, here's a bag of money uh, in cash bond and we'll give it to you, right? Um, so that's, they can either kind of do it themselves or they can incentivize the states to do it basically state by state. Awesome. Amazing. Um, 
So what do these alternative systems really look like? Like I know we talked about um, like, like the risk assessment, like what kind of structures do you ha need to have in place? Yeah, so there's, um, you know, like I said, it's state by state. So each county, each judge will use cash bond more than other counties. So in, in Cook County, we have reduced our use of cash bonds significantly, but other states, other counties use it more. Um, there are things called bail schedules that sometimes are used where uh, a judge will say or a system will say, hey, if you're charged with retail theft, uh, you have to pay $1,000 no matter what else is going on in the case. Uh, and there are also things that are like risk assessments that you talked about. And risk assessments aren't really replacements for cash bond. What they are are a tool that a judge will use to make a decision about what should happen in the case. So in Cook County, we have a risk assessment called the PSA. Uh, and basically what that is, is um, a pretrial services officer will take information from an accused person. Um, and then they'll basically put that information into an algorithm. And then the algorithm will basically um, allow, will give the judge a piece of information, um, a, what's called a risk score. And with that risk score in Cook County, the judge will make a decision about kind of what should happen. The judge may say, hey, we're gonna release the person. Hey, we're not gonna release the person, so on and so forth. Um, there are also other states that use risk assessments differently. Some states will say, if you get a certain risk assessment score, uh, certain uh, specific something specific will happen. Uh, there's a proposal in California like that. Um, but really, you know, lots of states and lots of counties do it differently. Great, great. Um, so now what I think a lot of the debaters um, are wondering, so what do you think are the best or like winning arguments um, on why we should reform cash bail? Well, um, you know, I'm biased, right? So <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a part of a coalition, the Coalition in Money Bond is one of 14 groups um, in the state that are looking in cash bail. And we really think it's an inefficient, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it, it doesn't, it, it, it does two things, right? There's two reasons, two major reasons why. Uh, first, it keeps too many people in jail, right? So because the vast majority of people in the justice system are poor, um, if you use money as a determining factor in getting people out, then lots of people just won't be able to get out because they're poor. Additionally, even for the people who are able to bail out, a lot of times that's family members that bail them out. It's not the person themselves, right? So uh, you have people coming from really poor communities that don't have a lot of money that are bonding people out, right? And that's creating real impacts in their lives, right? So, um, you know, people have to make horrible decisions about like, you know, do I pay the rent today or do I bond out my cousin? Or do I pay the light bill or do I bond out my cousin? Um, and then secondly, it's just like not a really good way of determining who should be in jail and who shouldn't be in jail, right? So there may be circumstances where you think somebody should be in jail. Well, if that's the case, then why are we using money and not risk to determine who should be in jail, right? We shouldn't, we should like look at the individual case and decide, hey, the person should be in or the person should be out. So those are two really the main reasons why, um, you know, we should end cash bond. And, and again, as we talked about before, when lots of people are in jail, they're more likely to plead guilty and they end up going to prison, right? And, you know, lots of people in prison is a bad thing, takes money out of communities, uh, innocent it's not fair things and so on and so forth yeah and then for whenever our debaters have to you know be on the negative um yeah. what do you think some of the like i guess biggest um arguments that you face uh, when you're advocating the reform of cash bail so like what is what is the other side saying yeah listen I'm, i was a debater for four years in high school so i'm well trained with having <laughs> to argue the affirmative and negative so i'm definitely down to talk about the negative reasons why. I think there are three kind of important reasons, and this is just kind of on the case, you know, there are always going to be disadvantages that are dealing with bigger things, but to the case, I think the first argument is that people argue that maybe people aren't won't be incentivized to come to court if they don't have to pay money, right? So the theory behind money is, listen, um, we want to give the person a reason to come back to court. So we'll hold a bunch of money from them. And so some people will argue, well, hey, if you don't, um, make people pay money bonds, then they may not come to court. Uh, the second reason is that courts kind of sometimes rely on that money, especially smaller jurisdictions, right? So in Illinois, we have a 10% system where let's say I get arrested in Victoria, you bond me out, uh, you put up the money. Well, no matter if I come to court every single time and resolve the case, 
uh, the court will keep ten dollars. So you pay a hundred, the court will take, keep ten dollars. So ten percent in one hundred and one of the one hundred and two counties. So they rely on that money to you know do whatever the government needs to function. And then the third thing is is that some people argue that hey, you're right, uh, majority of people are poor in the system, but more people in jail means that our communities are safer. So the idea that there are lots of bad people out there, and even if they're in jail just because they can't afford it, that's kind of good, right? So uh, I think those are kind of the three main reasons to the case why people support cash bond. Awesome. So a lot of the people who do, you know, support cash bond, a lot of the articles come from, you know, bondsmen themselves. Um, so can you kind of talk about like their role in that and also like the role politically and kind of how like all of that works? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I don't get a chance to work with bail bondsmen a lot, thank God, because <laughs> Illinois is one of four states that don't have bail bondsmen. So, um, but, uh, you know, in those states, what they argue is kind of the same thing that listen, um, we make sure people come back to court. Um, without us, nobody will come back to court and there'll be chaos. And we're basically serving a government function. Um, you know, politically, uh, it is um, a more liberal idea to end cash bond. Um, there, but there has been a strong kind of libertarian uh, folks that believe in small government uh, can also be for criminal justice reform and cash bond. You will have very conservative people kind of fall into that third argument that we just need to have as many people in jail as possible. Like that's the way you keep communities safe. Um, so we've heard Donald Trump in the past uh, few weeks kind of argue that we should get, uh, we should, you know, everybody should get a cash bond. Um, you also hear kind of conservative law enforcement fig figures argue that we should do whatever we need to do to keep people in and whether that's either giving people high cash bonds or just you know keeping them in keeping them in uh, a jail with no bond so yeah it's a great point about illinois um i didn't i didn't even know that um having not grown up in illinois um so who handles like the bail system in illinois is it all just in the courts is it how does that work if people are like i know yeah. you deed different property how does that function yeah, so we in Illinois just have mainly cash bond. So again, like I said, either a judge can decide we're going to let you out on a recognizance bond. So I mean, you don't have to put up any money. We just trust that you'll come back to court. Sport, sort of like a speeding ticket. Uh, we have no bonds where a judge will say, hey, you fit into a certain criteria where we're not going to let you out. And we have the third uh, where there's a cash bond. And usually the cash bonds are just are always decided by the judge. So the judge makes the determination about what the particular cash bond will be. But you also have the uh, the legislator. The legislator can pass laws basically saying, hey, there's no cash bond. This is you can't do this the way this way. You have to figure out uh, another way to resolve cases. So the legislator can control, but it's the judiciary that makes the actual on the ground decisions. And the judiciary themselves could, um, frankly, decide that they don't want to uh, use cash bonds either. Um, and higher courts can basically instruct, there's an argument that higher courts could instruct lower courts through court rules not to use cash bond. Awesome, awesome. Um, and then what advice do you have for debaters uh, debating this topic as a whole or um, like specifically cash bail? Uh, uh, be good, <laughs> debate well, study hard, know the evidence. Uh, I don't think I have anything super particular, you know, like every topic, uh, there are pros and cons. So you shouldn't fall in love with one side. You know, you it, it, even if you feel a certain way, uh, it is always good for debate purposes. And uh, for, you know, once you grow up and, you know, you're out of school, like being able to look at both sides of an argument, um, it's really helpful. And even if you're advocating for one side, uh, being very familiar with the other side, is helpful to you. So. Um, I'm always able to kind of figure out what are the arguments people uh, will make toward me so I'm better prepared uh, to, to head on those arguments. Awesome, awesome. And then if anyone has questions in the comments, um, you should um, drop them below. Um, so is there anything else that um, you want to add, Sharon? I think that's most of the questions we had, at least. Uh, no. Um, I can't answer any questions. Uh. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. We really, really, really appreciate it. Um, I want to echo what Victoria said. If we have any students who are watching that have any questions, definitely feel free to uh, drop them in the comments section. However, we definitely want to just kind of highlight to you all that we'll be doing this every other week um, until we pretty much get to about December, Christmas break. Uh, so please uh, mark it in your calendar to plan to tune in with Chicago Debates. Uh, I think at our next lecture series, we're really excited, we'll have uh, the 47th Ward uh, Ottoman who will come in and, and talk with us about Chicago politics and pol policing, uh, which should be a pretty exciting uh, topic. So that'll be take place on September 23rd. Um, I see we have a few questions. Oh, yeah. again. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Victoria, uh, to let you ask one of these. So, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so start with, um, I think, Braden here, which is, uh, what made you want to join the debate team back when you were young and in, in high school? Um, I love to argue. Um, my family loves to argue. My dad, uh, when he was alive, loved to argue. My mom uh, is an arguer. My family is. So it was just natural for me to join the debate team. Um, I love to talk. I love to think about things. So it was just something that came natural to me. There were some uh, people that were my friends that were on the debate team. So I love the teacher uh, who taught debate. You know, I still, he like actually lives down the street. Uh, so sometimes I see him going to the grocery store, even though I went to high school like a billion years ago. Uh, so um, yeah, it just, it was just natural for me. Awesome, awesome. And then Jared asked, how does electronic monitoring intersect with the use of bail bonds? Jared, that's an incredible question. Great question. <laughs> um, so essentially in Illinois, uh, electric mon electronic monitoring is a condition of bail. Uh, so what I mean by that is um, a judge can decide that a person should be released uh, until their trial, but may put conditions on that person. Uh, so some of those conditions could be maybe a, a curfew or um, uh, making the person refrain from drug use or alcohol use or possession of firearms. And electronic monitoring can also be considered a condition. So basically what it is for folks that don't know is that you're being released, uh, but the sheriff, and the sheriff is a person in charge of both maintaining the jail, uh, but also kind of overseeing people who are on pretrial um, they basically put a bracelet on you, um, electronic monitor on you. And with that monitor, depending on what type of monitor is, they can either ensure that you stay at home. So there'll be like a box in your, in your home and you have to stay close to that box and you have to keep like the monitor, which is shackled on you close to the box. So they maintain, make sure that you stay there, or there can be GPS where they can track where you are and uh, ensure that you don't go to a restricted area. So let's say for instance, you're charged with uh, hurting somebody. Um, they wanna make sure that you're not around that person so they can make sure you don't go there. And if you do go there, if you do violate the terms of your electronic monitoring, then the sheriff can come get you and throw you in jail. Um, so uh, yeah, that's how electronic monitoring uh, is used in the bond, con in the bond context. Awesome, awesome. Um, and so we had another question about why we chose the topic of bail, uh, which I think has to do with so the national topic is criminal justice reform. And in Chicago, we thought that cash bail would be a great thing to have you all discuss. Um, so I guess since you never got to argue cash bail, you never got the criminal justice topic, uh, what was your favorite like debate um, in case you did get to read then? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, it was such a long time ago. I, I mean, I remember there was an education topic um, and I got to debate a topic. Our plan was uh, consulting teacher unions uh, on uh, education policy. So uh, that was definitely one of the uh, topics uh, that I remember. Um, I can't remember what the overall topic was, but I think one time we got to argue about racial profiling. Um, which actually really influenced my work today, right? A lot of the work I do, or some of the work I do is around racial profiles. So I uh, learned about racial profiles. A high schooler uh, inspired me to come up, become a criminal defense attorney. So before I worked at this organization, I was a public defender. Um, and uh, after that, I uh, went to a nonprofit. So um, those are some of the 
most um, most impactful topics. Amazing. That's great to hear that you got to really use that knowledge from debate. Um, Jared has another question, which is um, when someone is released prior to trial, does whether or not they paid a bond affect how or if they are monitored um, in the current system? And then is that a function of risk assessment? Yeah, Jared, it's a great, another great question. So, um, you know, the judge basically can make a decision uh, about what conditions are put on you based upon uh, things that come out about you in the bond hearing. So let me take a step back. So each person goes through what's called a bond hearing. So your person gets arrested, they go in front of a judge and they have a bond hearing. And at the bond hearing, basically three people talk. A prosecutor talks and they basically talk about the things you got going on in your life, typically in your negative way, right? So your criminal history, uh, the allegation, the things that they said that you did, um, reasons why uh, maybe you should be stuck in jail traditionally. Now, there are prosecutors that are a little bit more lenient about that. Some prosecutors will say, hey, we don't think this person should be locked up. But traditionally, a prosecutor will talk about all the things um, uh, about you. Um, and then a defense attorney will come up and talk about all the good things, right? So they'll say, like, maybe you have an education. Maybe you have strong ties to the community. Maybe you're in school. Maybe you have a job. Maybe you have a family that you rely on. And they'll argue for you be released or for the bond to be as low as possible. And then after hearing all of that, uh, pretrial services will give the risk assessment score. Um, so that is all the information that was gathered by the court before the hearing. They put into the algorithm and they'll spit out a score. And the score will basically be on the likelihood that you will pick up a new case, um, or it could be like the likelihood, depending on the risk assessment, uh, that you come back to court. Um, and then the judge will make a decision based upon those three kind of inputs, what the prosecutor said, what the defense attorney said, and what pretrial services say in deciding what your the outcome should be. And uh, to answer your question, um, conditions may be based upon whether you pay the bond or not, uh, but typically the conditions will be the same whether you paid it or not, didn't pay. Now, what's, what can happen sometimes is a judge could say, hey, if you pay the cash bond, we're going to put you on electronic monitoring, um, while other people, if they pay the cash bond, they'll get out. So I hope that answered the first part of that question. I know it was a bit confusing. Uh, and to, to the risk assessment point, the risk assessment will basically, uh, depending on the risk assessment, there are a bunch of risk assessment tools out there, but the one we use in Cook County will uh, give uh, an opinion on what level of conditions there should be. So it'll say, hey, you should release this person with no conditions. You, you should release this person with full conditions. But one thing the risk assessment score, risk assessment actually doesn't do, it doesn't actually talk about money. So it'll just say, hey, this is the person's risk. These are the conditions you should put on. But it'll never say, like, you should give this person a $10,000 bond or a $100,000 bond. It just doesn't work that way. Awesome. Well, I feel like I know a lot more about how bonds are set <laughs> and how <laughs> risk assessment works. Um, <laughs> Awesome. Um, Daniel asks, um, what is some advice you can give to our debaters? Well, about the topic, uh, here's one of the interesting things. So the criminal justice system uh, has been turned on its head because of COVID. Um, and for a long time, the courts were actually closed down, uh, basically. And now they're starting to open back up a little bit. But one of the interesting things that's out there is now bond hearings in Illinois are on YouTube. So you can actually go to YouTube and actually watch a bond hearing. And I always think this is really interesting. For me, as a debater, it's, it's always cool to be very close to the topic and try to understand the topic as much as you can. So um, obviously, there are restrictions on what cards you can read. Um, so you should follow the rules with that. But I think it's always great to uh, think more about the topic and do your own research just so you understand it at least, even if you're not actually able to read those cards. So um, my advice would be try to read as much about either cash bond or predictive policing or whatever you're affirmative running. Be really comfortable with the literature so that you know what you're talking about. And it'll come off, especially when you're doing your speeches that aren't so scripted, right? Your, you know, uh, two ARs and, and two NRs, right, are going to be better when you really are comfortable with the topic and you're not robotic and just reading stuff that you've already prepared. 
Yeah, that is that is some great advice. Uh, spoken truly like a former debater. Um, <laughs> great to have you. I think that's um, all of our questions. Um, and thank you so much. You dropped so much just great knowledge uh, about debate and the topic and cash bail. Like I feel like I know so much more about cash bail than I you know did starting, and I did a lot of the research for the case. Um, so. Well, if anybody has any questions, you can definitely reach out to Victoria and. Uh, reach out, you know, she, I'm sure she can get in contact with me. And you guys have a great, great, great speaker next week or next couple of weeks from now. If it's the 47th Ward Alderman, I believe it's Matt Martin. And he's a super smart dude, uh, one of the real experts on policing. So I would advise you guys to tune in. He's super smart. Um, he's a future star. Um, and it'll be great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will see you all in two weeks. Um, and come back with more questions for um, our alderman about the topic. So he'll be speaking about Chicago policing and politics. So that will be another really exciting deep dive into the topic. So thank you.